Thanks, everyone. Okay, so what is healthy body image? It's being comfortable with who you are, being comfortable in your own skin, being comfortable with the way you look, being happy with what you can do, accepting yourself the way you are and valuing who you are, not just what you, you look like and not just what you can do. And I've put a big disclaimer there saying it's important to feel like this most of the time, not all the time, because that's impossible. We're human and we have really rotten days where we feel not very good and that's normal. So if you're pretty happy with yourself most of the time, then you've got a really healthy body image and that's great. So I just also wanted to show you how body image fits into our overall view of ourselves. But body image or your physical self-esteem is just one small part of your overall self-esteem and your overall self-worth. But sometimes we can become overly focused on how we look. For whatever reason, we've just become really focused on our physical appearance um, and it's really important to us and it starts to outweigh other things. If the way you look is so important to you that it makes up most of the way you feel about yourself, you're going to be very vulnerable to threats. For example, if, some, if your friends say something nasty, you're going to be a lot more vulnerable to that if that's what makes up most of your self-esteem. So a much more healthy way to be is to value the person that you are across lots of different domains and really foster the development of those other domains. That makes you a lot more resilient in the face of those pressures that you might get from friends or wherever else. I also just wanted to touch on how body image, body image actually develops in children. It actually begins to develop around the age of three, which is a scary thought. Don't panic, we don't have to go out and start, you know, um, protecting three-year-olds. It just means that at the age of three, children kind of learn that, okay, this is what my body looks like and this is who I am and starting to recognise, conceptualise that, that this is my body. But there's no evaluations there. Little, little kids just kind of think, oh, this is me and that's you and that's all good. <laughs> there's no real evaluations when they're very little. It's around the ages of middle childhood, I'd say starting at the age of six, really becoming quite prominent at the age of eight to 10, where children start to engage in social comparisons. So they start to engage in social comparisons, but also they become evaluative. So they're not just looking, comparing themselves and kind of going, oh, well, that's all good. They're looking at themselves, comparing to other children and going, hmm, yeah, I, I'm not so sure about that anymore um, and putting an evaluation on it, good or bad. So this is when we really kick in with our body image promotion um, programs and strategies because this is probably when they need it most. They need these positive messages around that middle childhood um, point. People think all children have the same kind of body image concerns, but it's actually quite gender specific. And it's something to be aware of if you've got little boys or little girls. Because little girls, as we know, they're just a little bit more appearance focused. So it's something to be a little bit more aware of. And for a long time, everyone assumed, oh, they're little boys, they don't, they don't worry about body image, they don't really care about what they look like. So not true, they do. But it's just that for boys, there's a greater focus on what they can do with their body. So just something to, um, Keep in mind when you're dealing with little boys as opposed to little girls. So what actually affects the development of body image? So there's three main factors that we talk about in the research. Um, and as you might have guessed, parents, of course, their friends, their peers, also the media. They all impact on children's body image because they're, they're part of um, children's culture around them. And of course, the culture that children grow up in is going to shape the way they think and feel about their bodies and other people's. So parents, I think parents in childhood are probably the biggest um, influence, as you might have guessed, because they're the primary kind of care, I guess, for the child in their early years. So parent influence happens in really two ways. So it's via messages. It's the things you directly say to your children, obviously. Um, your attitudes towards appearance, the things they can do. Um, 
appearance of people in general. But parents often forget that the other key way that they're influential is what they model. You can give your children affirmations every day and tell them wonderful, wonderful things. But then if you stand in front of the mirror and you're very self-critical, they pick up on that. So it's what you model. It's your own behaviour, your own attitudes that you may convey without necessarily even realising. And we all do it. I'm, I'm certainly not pointing fingers. We all do that. So it's just something to have in the back of your mind and be aware of. Peer influence. Teasing and bullying can have a really prominent effect. Schools still have a long way to go on that. But I do feel like there's hope. There's a lot of fantastic research at the moment going on um, and programs being developed that are going into almost every primary school that's really educating children on um, uh, relationships and bullying and teasing. So I think, watch this space, I think there's good things to come in primary schools. So there's a bit of hope there. Children go to primary school and it's also that time that they're starting to compare themselves to other children and they're surrounded by children of a similar age so comparisons are going to be natural. So children aren't just influential in terms of what they say to each other, they're influential in just being together I guess. And inevitably, I guess, um, children might, in the later years of childhood, middle to late, will become more appearance focused. And um, it's something we can try and um, shift them away from, try and put their focus on other abilities, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, but I think that increasing focus on um, appearance is pretty normal. Um, and that might be related to their limb difference. But it might not be. It might just be that natural um, uh, focus on appearance because that's the stage of development they're going through. I just wanted to mention media briefly. It's not as um, prominent as the other two. It's probably the lesser of the three in terms of impact, but I think it's still worth mentioning because um, Children are exposed to, inevitably exposed to, all different kinds of media. You, you can't really um, shield them from the media. It's everywhere. We're saturated. And unfortunately, still, after decades of really good body image research, the media don't reflect diversity in human appearance. Um, they tend to focus on the one body type and this can kind of create um, an expectation that just that one kind of body shape is the norm which is unfortunate because, you know, um, that's not, it doesn't match reality. So I think in terms of media influence, as much as I would like to change this and I, I'd like to see it changed, I, I don't hold high hopes for it being changed in the near future. So my answer to media influence is it just reinforces the point that we have to equip the children with strategies and skills and really strengthen them so that they're able to deal with this and that media influence doesn't really affect their own self-worth. So part three. This is probably most, the most important part where um, I'm going to talk a little bit about actually how you can promote body image and resilience um, in children. And this stuff is really widely applicable. I think one of the, um, the key things is um, to be open to discussion. It's, it's a, such a simple thing, but such an important thing because um, it can be so difficult to hear children talk about the things that they can't do. So difficult to hear children talk about the, the ways they feel different or um, things like that. And the natural response a lot of the time is to deflect, distract and move on. Let's, look, let's think about this instead, which, which you want to do so the child doesn't get upset. But it also sometimes can make it a little bit more stressful for the child because they're having these feelings and they're still going to feel that way even if you kind of brush over it and move on and it's not validating them. And they can feel a little bit like their feelings are being brushed aside. So being open to talking about it really is a perfect opportunity to bring up the um, everyone is different message. 
um, talk about it, actually discuss with them. No two bodies are the same and that's okay. And actually let's explore this because it's, there's nothing to be embarrassed about here. Um, diversity is a good thing. Which is, brings me to my next point. Promote the message, everybody's different and that's okay. Such a simple message, we all know it's a good thing. But how do you actually do that in everyday life? How do you actually promote this message? So as I was just saying, look for opportunities to talk about diversity and what a wonderful thing it is. This is one example that we've done with hundreds of children. Um, we actually to get them to think about ways that they are different to their family members and isn't that a great thing? And then other ways that they're similar to their other family members, similar to their friends at school, different to the things that their friends at school, the strengths they have, the uh, areas that they need to work on. Highlight those because diversity is a good thing. The next one is um, promoting the message that people are valuable for who they are. And once again, simple message, of course we know it's good, but how do you actually do that in everyday life? It's how you talk to your children. What, what do you emphasise in them? How do you praise them? How do you tell them they've good, done a good, a good job? Because whatever you praise in them, whatever points you decide to highlight in them is what you're going to encourage. So it's, it's all well and good to say, oh, you're looking really nice today, you're looking really pretty, That's, that looks really lovely. But you don't always want to focus there because they're going to learn that, well, appearance must be really important and it's really important for me to look good all the time. The same with physical abilities. It's great to say, oh, you did that really well, you're getting much better, um, you moved really quickly, whatever it is. But we don't always want the focus to be there. We want them to value their own personal characteristics. So when you're praising them, make sure you're always praising those characteristics as well. Um, I've just thrown up some examples here. We use this worksheet in class and it's a way to tell children that, you know, highlight those other characteristics like, you know, you're a great friend, um, you're funny, you're a great listener, all those other qualities as well because it's going to build up their self-worth in other areas other than their appearance and the things they can physically do. This is a really important one, particularly with children um, with limb difference, disabilities, build their self-efficacy. Self-efficacy isn't self-esteem, it's something quite different. Self-esteem is um, how good you feel about yourself. Your self-efficacy relates to how, how confident are you in your ability to do things. And any things like walk, talk, have a conversation with someone, make a friend, colour in, um, sing a song, anything. It's your, your faith in your abilities to do things and it's such a critical aspect of um, feeling good about yourself. Every child needs to feel like they're good at something and you need to help them to find things that they're good at really and really focus on it. Um, so particularly with children with um, a limb difference or a disability, um, something that you help them to find their little niche. What are they good at? What do they love? Because they'll always be able to fall back on that in times when they're, when they're struggling in another domain and that makes them feel, um, it gives them strength. Set them achievable uh, responsibilities. A lot of the time you think, oh no, I, I don't want to get them to do that, I don't want to get them to do that. You, it's such a great thing to create confidence in themselves to give them achievable responsibilities, even if it's it's your job to make sure um, the dog has water every night. That's your job and it's very important. That builds up their self-worth, gives them a purpose and it actually, um, it sets up the mind frame that, you know, well, I have this job. Um, it, it, it increases their self-efficacy in their ability to do things, just little tasks like that, achievable ones. Let them make decisions. When you let them make decisions, even how, no matter how small they are, it teaches them that their voice is important. What they say is important um, and it's going to have an impact. Be aware that you're a role model. So your attitudes towards um, appearance, uh, speak kindly about other people, what they can do and the way they look. Um, 
try to, I know it's hard sometimes because we're all very critical of ourselves, but try and avoid those um, self-criticisms in the mirror. Another really important thing when we come to peers, it's um, children, bullying and teasing aside, children are curious and they're not diplomatic. They're very insensitive sometimes and they will ask point blank, ah, well, you know, what, what, what's, um, what's wrong or what's the difference? So one way you can really empower your children is prepare them for that. Have a response ready, discussed with them that they feel comfortable saying in their language that is meaningful to them. They don't have to miss a beat. They can come straight back with, oh, well, did you know? And it's almost like they're teaching other children. They're teaching them that, well, this is nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, this is promoting diversity. This is empowering me because I can talk about it. Um, so it's a really good thing to prepare the child for those questions. This is another really important factor. Um, there's going to be days, as much as you've prepared children, it's human nature, there's going to be days that don't go to plan. Something's happened, someone said something, they feel like they can't do something, they're just feeling rotten. That's okay. There's a technique called cognitive behavioural therapy um, and it's something that's used universally. universally. Um, we call it a technique of helpful strategies, sorry, helpful thoughts versus unhelpful thoughts. And it helps children restructure how they think about their strengths and weaknesses. And I'll, I'll demonstrate this. This is a, an activity we've done with many, many children now. So we say to the children, okay, imagine, imagine that this girl, she's very upset because she can't run like the other children in her class. What's an unhelpful thought she might have? And the children will say, oh, you know, she'll think, oh, I'm too slow. She might think, oh, the other children won't include me in games. And then we say, and how do you think she'd feel if she thought those things? And they'd say, oh, very sad, unhappy, even angry. And then we'd say to them, okay, what's some more helpful thoughts she could have? And they'd come up with things like, oh, well, it doesn't really matter because I'm good at lots of other things. Or my good friends don't really care if I can run or not. And then how does that make you feel? Oh, happy. Oh, that's okay. Relieved. That makes me feel good. So it's such a simple activity, but we do it with kids and kids just get it. Adults have a, a hard time swapping unhelpful thoughts for helpful thoughts. I think it's because we're so used to thinking in the negative, unfortunately. Kids don't. Kids are resilient and they pick this up so quickly. And the more often you do it, not only does it help them in that moment to feel better, but it actually sets them up to have just that way of thinking where they immediately revert to, ah, oh, well, this is the more help, helpful thought in this situation. And I say helpful thoughts because I don't like the word think positively. What, how do you feel when something awful has happened and someone says to you, oh, think positively? Yeah, you feel like slapping them. It's totally unhelpful. Yeah, so <laughs> helpful thought. Thoughts are neither good or bad, but there are some thoughts that make us feel good and they're helpful and some thoughts that just aren't going to help us. So to summarise, be open to discussion. It's a really good thing. And in that, talk, talk about diversity and how it's a fabulous thing and how it, it, um, people are, are valuable for who they are, not what they look like and not what they can do. Help them prepare for their peers. Um, let them develop their own little explanation that they feel comfortable, comfortable and it's meaningful to them so that when someone asks them, there's not a moment of embarrassment, hesitation or anything. They just come straight back with, this is what it is and that's empowering for them. Finally, helpful thinking strategies is a really powerful tool for children because it's their natural tendency to think in the positive, so work with their natural strengths and develop that because it not only makes them feel better in the moment, but it sets them up for a, a, for a lifetime, I guess, of thinking in the more positive. Thank you.